Next speaker is Steve Goddard speaking about building an innovation-minded culture at UNL, challenges and opportunities. Very good. Excellent. Yes, information. That's exactly right. Some of you thought, maybe it's for innovation since that's what I was going to talk about. No. <laughs> I'm going to talk about information. Why? Well, a while back, when Al Gore created the information age, the information highway, uh, there was a lot of buzz about information, and we talked about the information superhighway, we talked about the information age, and now today we have iPhones, we have iPads, we have iMacs, and some of us just have regular computers. <laughs> okay? And with these co computing devices, we can access any information we want in seconds from anywhere, anytime. That's an amazing transformation that we've gone through in just the last seven years. Information is all around us. Sometimes it feels like we're drowning in information. Well, that's led to another change. The information age has given way to what I call an information economy. Some people call it an information world. Managing the information has become more lucrative than building devices in our economy. It's a huge industry, if not an entire economy. I don't think it's yet our entire economy, and hopefully it won't become, because we still need to eat, as we heard earlier. We need food, right? That's a whole other uh, industry as well. So, and that's part of our economy. But we've gone from making devices and selling them to managing information, and here's how pervasive that is. Think about the Great Recession that began in 2008. Highest unemployment rates the U.S. has seen in decades. During that same time, every computer science, computer engineering, information technology graduate had three or more offers, job offers, before they graduated. There were more jobs, more jobs available than we had applicants going into it. What did that do? That drove up salaries to an average starting salary coming out of a bachelor's degree of $57,000. That's during a really bad economic time. It's projected through 2020 that the number of jobs in the information sector, the information economy, is going to be, is going to, the number of jobs is going to outnumber the qualified applicants by 30%. This is huge. This is a tremendous change that we're going through. This means we need different skills. We need to do things differently. And what, what brought about all this change? A sequence of transformations, of innovation. Innovative transformations brought us there. What's it going to take to survive? Innovation, sure. But not just innovation. That's the starting point. We need to constantly innovate. We can't stop at one innovation 
and say, oh, we're here, we, we did it, good, congratulate ourselves. All right, that's not going to do it. The IT industry is full of companies that fell by the wayside or are completely gone because they failed to innovate. How many people have a BlackBerry? Raise your hand if you have a BlackBerry. One, good, congratulations. Two, three, four, okay, good. Five years ago, the BlackBerry was the status symbol, the power symbol. We were debating the etiquette of the BlackBerry prayer. Today, Research in Motion, the company that created the BlackBerry, is fighting for its very survival. I don't expect them to be around in two years. If you have their stock, you should have sold it five years ago. Okay? <laughs> How many people have an iPhone? I can't even count that high. Okay? It's, so that's the way it was five years ago with the BlackBerry. Research in Motion failed to innovate. We need to pay attention to that because we now live in an information world. We are a university. We should be playing a starting role in that. What does that mean for us? How do we survive in that? We're going to constantly innovate. We need to build an innovation culture. I don't know how to teach you to be innovative, but I do have some ideas on what it takes to allow innovation to occur. As an institution, I don't think UNL can be an innovative institution because we declare it to be. We're going to create an innovation campus, but what does that mean? Okay, we have to allow people to be innovative, and the innovation will come if we build the right environment from the ground up, and we'll be recognized as an innovation, innovative institution. We'll have an innovation-minded culture. When I first uh, came to to uh, UNL, I, I worked in industry for 12 years before coming, or 13 years actually, nine years in my own company before coming here. And so I, I'm used to doing things a little bit differently than the way they're done at, at uh, university. And so I frequently ask to do something new. And the reason I ask permission to do it is because it hasn't been done before and it's different and so I want to ask how to do it. And I frequently get the answer, no. Can I do this? No. Why? Well, we don't, we've never done that before. Yeah, I know, that's why I'm asking. If you had done it before, we need to ask. This is new, I realize that. But why can't we do this? And they were just, I think these blank stares, like, well, because I just told you, we've never done that before. That has to change. We can't have innovation if our first response is, no, we don't do that here. Because we haven't done that here. Tradition's great. But it can't hold us back. We've got to be, we've got to embrace tradition, but be open to the future and open to changes and balance that. Recently, I've heard a new message from our administrators. If you've had the chance to, to listen to uh, Chancellor Perlman or um, Vice Chancellor Ronnie Green or Alan Weisinger, we heard Ronnie talk a little earlier, there's a different message coming out. And, and Dr. Weisinger says it this way, she often will say, how can we help you? That's powerful. If we can, we can stop and instead of saying no, we can say, what is it you'd like to do? Why? And then consider whether that's worthwhile. Then we can say, how can we help you do that? It's easy to say no when you know it's going to create extra work for you. help you because now you're inviting more work for yourself. That's required. The other thing we have to do is we have to be open to failure. We have to take risks. We cannot innovate successfully every time. I think that's great. That's okay. Right? From that failure, For us, we can learn something new. We are at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We are an institution of higher learning. There's another opportunity to learn, right? We should be embracing that. But that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to be willing to say, How can we help you? and be open to failure at the same time. So we need to create an environment that rewards that risk taking. 
instead of penalizing the failure. Now, we, we, don't get me wrong, we don't want everything to end up in failure, but we, if we're trying new things, some will, but we'll have a lot of good things happen. Okay? Now, if that's all it took, it'd be easy, but we've got to practice, we've got to try some of these things. I, I'm sure there's more. I don't know, I haven't gotten that far through this process, but I know the, those two things are critical. But let's think about what that would mean for some of the problems and challenges we face coming up. Last year, Chancellor Perlman said that he wanted UNL to grow from about 25,000 students to 30,000 students in five years, 2017, let's say. I don't know if he was talking about that academic year or the year after. Okay, so let's say five years from now. I've heard uh, Dr. Weisinger say 36,000 she thinks will hit. Both those scare me, right? And like, that's 25 to 33 percent more students than we have now. Where are we going to put them? My classes are full. Where all their lab sections are full, we don't have room for another 25 percent more students in this lab. How are we going to solve that? Well, that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. It's really a spatial problem. It's a spatial-temporal problem. I'm going to transform it. We have the space. If you go to that lab at 9, 10, midnight, it's empty. There's a lot of space. Right? So if, if we said, we're going to open up this lab at midnight, like some institutions are doing, and 25% of our students take a midnight class, problem solved. All those new students are going to midnight class. Well, maybe not that, right? But some will. Now, I don't want to go to a class at midnight. Not anymore, but many would be open to it. Then we have to get professors to try and teach it. I'm guessing that most won't. But the good news is we don't need everyone to teach a class at that time. We need just some. And for some, that's a better time for them to work and to teach that class, that lab section, or that lecture, than early in the day. We need to try some of these things and see what happens. Okay. The other thing I think we need to do is change the focus from teaching to learning. We talked a lot about technology. Technology did a lot of those innovations, and we've talked, heard about it several times today. Can technology help us learn? You know, can, we, can we have a program that lets us submit a solution, and it automatically grades and gives us feedback immediately? We have some of those in our department, but can be done in other disciplines. I don't know. But it might be worth looking at it. There's some initial upfront cost, but maybe if you have enough students going through that you cover that initial cost, you can scale up better. It will change the way we learn. If the goal is learning as opposed to getting this assignment done right the first time, this could be a way to help. Recently, universities have uh, put, put out, created these massive open online courses, MOOCs. Has anyone heard about them? Some of you have. Uh, Stanford had one recently, last spring. Over 150,000 people enrolled in it. 150,000 in one online class. There's no way they're all going to talk to the, to the teaching assistant, let alone the instructor. So how do they do that? How does that work? Well, first, a lot of them drop it, OK? But, but even if 10% even if stick through to 15,000. What happens? Researchers have been looking at how do you teach at that scale. It turns out they don't need the instructor and they don't need the TA to answer their questions. Technology has created the opportunity to create online forums. Instructors created official forums, but then a lot of offline informal forums created and clusters formed and cluster leaders evolved and emerged. And so students would post a question, and they would quickly get a response, just like we heard a little bit ago, within an hour and a half, got all kinds of answers, right? And the interesting thing was the answer converged very quickly to the correct answer. It's the collective, collective wisdom, right? The wisdom of the community coming through. Now the TA, teaching assistant, just has to monitor some of these to make sure that, that 
that the correct things are progressing, correct information is moving through. That's a lot less work. We're, we're teaching each other peer instruction. Very, very powerful. Let's think about these MOOCs. We, they're they're going to come, they're, they're, they're building. Can we, can we do something about them? In other words, can we use them here at UNL? What should we do? I don't know yet, but I've started thinking about this. We could ignore them. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, we could contribute to them. We could build our own online course on some topic where we have the world's expert and open it up. People aren't making money on these yet, but neither did Google when it first started. Okay? Most of the internet companies start off giving away their products and they figure out to make money later. We're, we're an institution of learning, not necessarily to make money, but don't mistake it, we are asked to operate as a business. And we need to start thinking about things like that. We might be able to, for example, if, there's, if these classes develop, these books develop, we might be able to use them in a way that students take that course and then we give certification for it. They pay a fraction of the enrollment cost to come in and take an exam and verify that they've mastered that material and we give them credit and they can count that toward their degree, right? I'm sure the administrators higher up are just want to kill me at this point, right? For saying something like that. But, but these are, we have to explore these, up, these ideas and see what, what will work and what will not work. Right? I think we, we just can't ignore them. Oops, let me go back. Uh, slowly. There we go. Another thing that we've done to try and combine technology and be a little bit innovative. We created last year the C Computer Science Engineering, I'm chair of the Computer Science Engineering Department, we created what we call the CSE Innovation Lab. <clears throat> this began focusing around capstone senior design courses, but it was much broader than that. And what we want to do is bring together people from industry, from government, from, from academic ranks, the students, to work on projects, exploring technologies. Some of these projects will fail. And when companies come to us and say, well, we'd like you to develop this, the first thing we tell them is, look, you have to understand, this may not work. Failure has to be an option, or we can't work on this in the lab. But it creates a very dynamic environment where students can try new things. We can evaluate new technologies with companies. We can take advantage of expertise from companies, from faculty, from students. We teach each other things. And it's very interdisciplinary. So there's an opportunity to do peer teaching. There's an opportunity to try out new ideas. There's an opportunity to fail. I think those are all part of what creates an innovative culture. I believe that this kind of a concept will be at the heart of the innovation campus when it, when it evolves. There will be many other parts of it too. But I think if we're going to have a Nebraska Innovation Campus, then we're going to have a lot of collaborations with different people. This is, uh, this is on, the, on the Nebraska Innovation Campus website, so I just stole a picture, put up there, hope that's okay with them. Um, and, and so in the Nebraska Innovation Campus, we're going to have people trying out new ideas, companies interacting differently. We're, researchers are going to have to do things differently. <coughs> we're going to have to be innovative. Some things will not work, but we have to be willing to invest in, in those activities. We have to be willing to try and see what will happen. I'm really excited by the opportunities and the challenges that are ahead. I'm excited that the, the, I hear, I sense in the university a change is occurring, an openness, a desire to be innovative. I don't think we know what that means yet. I don't know if we ever will, but I think that the, the beginnings are there. The seeds are being planted. It's going to be really exciting. And what I want you to do, and what I want you to carry forward from this talk, is to be thinking about innovation. I want you to go forward, and I want you to innovate big, OK? That's, that's what I want you to, to be thinking about, is how can I innovate big? And of course, I got the Big Ten logo, but I got permission on this one with the trademark. Um, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you.